Number 5. Hypnotic Regression Many people who claim to have been abducted by aliens are unable to remember a lot of the specific details of their abductions. Because of this and the public stigma against people with alien experiences, many people choose to never come forward, or their stories are written off as delusion. But in the spirit of giving people the benefit of the doubt, let's talk about a certain woman's experience with hypnotic regression. A woman who claims she was abducted by aliens was put under hypnosis in order to give a documentary crew information information about the visitors from other worlds. When asked how aliens are able to travel at such incredible speeds, she responded with the following, I can't explain it, but it's like if they want to get from one point to another point, they remove what's in between, so they don't have to travel that distance. They are instantly from there to there. When asked why aliens are studying humans, the response was, they are very wary of humankind. Mankind is progressing technology-wise, and soon he's going to come across technology that will allow him to peel back the layers of dimensions. And they want to know all about man for their own benefit. Man's warlike, aggressive, an animal. He's in possession of technology that is more than he is. There's no balance, and they're very wary that he's now on the threshold of many breakthroughs, one of which is peeling back dimensions. It's like an onion skin. You peel back one layer, and there's another one underneath, and another one underneath, and another one underneath. The same with dimensions. They're scared. Do aliens really study humanity out of a fear of what we will do once we discover interdimensional travel? And if so, how do they feel about all the UFOs we have apparently shot down? What do species historically do with groups that they are afraid of? What fate awaits the human race at the hands of these interplanetary visitors? Number 4. Sam the Sandown Clown our next story comes from the January-February edition of the British UFO Research Association Journal and concerns an anonymous man going by the alias of Mr. Y, who claims that one October night in the year 1970, he was driving to visit a friend when he saw something hovering over the swamp to his right. It was a huge UFO with several different multicolored orb-like lights brightly illuminating the craft. He got out of his vehicle to observe the craft for a moment and then continued on his way. He looked out his window and realized that the craft was now following him, its lights spinning. Mr. Y got to his friend's house and the friend was amazed at the guests that had followed him there before disappearing into a nearby tree line. For years, Mr. Y would see the red orbs following him from time to time, watching him and stalking him. Doubting that anyone would believe him, he kept these encounters to himself until 1973 when his seven-year-old daughter Faye and her friend were playing near Lake Common Road when they heard an eerie wailing sound. They followed the sound to a nearby meadow and the wailing stopped. They walked over a small bridge when suddenly a blue gloved hand with three fingers appeared from under the bridge. They looked looked in the small river and saw a strange figure standing in the middle holding a book. He was described as being seven feet tall and without a neck. He was wearing an odd and tattered costume consisting of a green tunic with a red collar, white pants, and a pointed hat with a black ball on top and two antenna. He had a pale white face, lips that never moved, red hair, and triangle holes for eyes. The children watched in shock as the figure hobbled over to a strange metal hut. Not long after, they saw the figure again as he wailed, and then spoke into a microphone asking if they were still there. He then communicated by writing in his book, saying that his name was Sam. They asked if he was a man, and he said no. They asked if he was a ghost, and he said, well, not really, but in a way I am. He said that there were others like him and that he was afraid of being attacked by humans. He invited them into his metal hut, which was filled with wooden furniture and elaborate knobs. The children hung out with Sam for an hour before leaving, and a year later she told her father about the encounter, telling him that there had been men nearby fixing a post who had acted as though they could not see the strange creature. He had trouble believing her, 
but he had had enough experiences with aliens of his own that he had to consider the possibility that it was real. Did Mr. Y's daughter really see a strange alien in the woods, or is this just the overactive imagination of a child? In an age where spacecraft are being seen all over the world at an alarming rate, we really can't rule anything out. And what of the UFO stalking Mr. Y? What were they hoping to see, and why was he selected to be the subject of their curiosity? This mystery will likely never be fully unraveled. Number 3. Aliens Take a Baby Our next entry comes courtesy of phantomsandmonsters.com and describes a 14-year-old visiting the home of some seniors and seeing something more terrifying than they could possibly imagine. As they themselves told it, I witnessed an alien abduction back in 2002 when I was 14. A friend of mine wanted me to help her grandparents set up their computer. I said sure and rode my bicycle to their house. I got there and clouds appeared, so I decided to make this a pretty quick visit. I set up the computer and installed some software for them, showing them all how it works and such. They go back and sit on the couch while I get my backpack to get ready to leave, as their other granddaughter, who is about six years old, was sleeping in the other room. All of a sudden, a cold breeze went through the room. It was odd, as all the doors and windows were shut. The grandparents looked towards the kitchen, and what I saw made me freeze in place. There were three creatures standing in the kitchen. Two of them were short, gray, alien creatures, with thicker necks than usually described, with the eyes closer to the sides of their heads. They wore silver jumpsuits. In between them was a taller creature that looked like a humanoid mantis, wearing a black robe with a yellow stripe going down the middle. They walked to another room, and a minute later returned with the robed creature, carrying the granddaughter in its arms. It's looking at me, and I get the feeling it knows who I am. I don't know why I got the feeling, but I did. I was very scared. The grandparents were looking at them too, but not doing anything. I thought, screw this, and fought off all the fear I could and clumsily charged towards them. I didn't even make three steps before the grandfather stopped me and told me they will bring her back. The creatures didn't move and continued to look at me. I couldn't get any more words out of my throat because I didn't even know what to think at this point. All of a sudden, a light stretched around them and they vanished. An odd glow remained for a few seconds before fading. After a minute of awkward silence and the grandfather repeating, she will be brought back, soon I decided to leave. I rode my bicycle home as fast as I could while looking back, hoping that nothing was following me. I didn't sleep that night after I got home. The next day, I told my friend what had happened, and she told me it has happened before. The grandparents and other family members have tried to stop it, but to no avail. They just accepted it with a look of defeat and moved on. The granddaughter was brought back after a few hours. Not long after I witnessed this incident, their whole family moved elsewhere. I've heard from other people who claimed to experience similar events, and I feel they are legit. Why are aliens taking babies away from their families? What are they hoping to learn? And is there some way to stop them? One can hope, but it seems unlikely. Number 2. Dream or Abduction this next story is from an anonymous Reddit user who claimed to be abducted and experimented on by aliens before waking up at home with injuries related to the experiment. As he told the story, In July of 2015, back when I was 19, I lived in a house in Southport, Sacramento with three other friends. I woke up one night to a light coming through the ceiling of my room, and it lifted me out of my bed. Next thing I know, I'm in some kind of chair and unable to control my body like I was drugged with something. There were guys that were not human men, but gray people with large black almond-shaped eyes doing stuff with what seemed like medical instruments and machines. I was very terrified. I was unarmed, naked, unable to move. I was so scared. One of them was touching the machine that put the tube down my throat and into my stomach. His hand got close to my face because he had to adjust something holding my head in place. I remember getting a good look at his hand and eyes. They had long fingers with pads at the tips, sort of like salamanders, and they don't have fingernails. Their skin is gray, but kind of like a powdery translucent gray. They had large heads with small necks, so small and thin it didn't make sense. Their arms and fingers were long and skinny too. I was in the chair with my head and jaw held by something so I didn't see their feet. I'd say the tallest probably stood about the height of my lowest rib, and for reference, I'm 5'10". The tube machine sucked out the food I ate earlier that day, and then was pulled out of me. I don't remember how I got there, but then I remembered being in a cage made of some kind of metal that reminded me of aluminum. In a room with curved walls, in front of me was a man who looked a lot like a human, talking to a gray person on a window that lit up a screen like a hologram. The man was tall and looked like a human, except that his skin was very white and his hair was blonde and platinum. He spoke with a gray person 
on the hollow screen in a language I didn't understand. He wore a blue flight uniform of some kind. This man was obviously military of some sort, judging by his uniform. The gray person spoke in a language that sounded like birds chirping. Once the call was over, the hollow screen turned into a different display with symbols, and the man turned and walked to me. He crouched down and spoke to me in plain English and said to me, Everything's gonna be fine. I'm going to get you out of here and take you home. I was so happy to hear that. He opened the cage, and next thing I know, I fell on top of my bed with my back hitting the mattress first. I immediately got out of bed right after I fell. Was this a real alien abduction or simply a horrible nightmare? Typically, I would think it was merely a bad dream, but the user describes extreme pain in his throat for days afterwards from the tube being forced into him. What was the source of this pain if it was simply a dream? Truly a strange encounter to contemplate. Number 1. The Alien and the Bassinet our final story is another from phantomsandmonsters.com about a woman who was asleep in bed next to her baby's bassinet before waking up and seeing something that would make any mother panic. The following is an excerpt from her account. I turned over on my side, facing the bassinet, and noticed a bright light coming in between the window blinds. I thought out loud, is it morning already? The light was coming in between the blinds, and it was so bright, but the rest of the room was dark. There was also a bright light on the wall next to the window, and I looked up to see where the light was coming from. To my horror, just above the bassinet was an alien's gray face face. It was just the head, no upper body, legs, or arms. The head was dark in color, very round, ending in a pointed chin, and there was a small slit for a mouth. The nostrils were small, but the eyes were large and almond-shaped and very shiny black. It had some sort of glass lamp on the top of its head. The light on the wall was projected from the lamp. Then I noticed that the being was looking down at my baby daughter. Oh my god, I couldn't speak. My heart started pounding so hard that I started trembling uncontrollably. It saw me and realized I was looking at it. The being moved towards me and I started screaming and swinging my arms. I remember that I screamed out loud for it to leave. It floated from its original position above the bassinet to just above my face. I remember seeing this light blue fog build up in front of my face, and then in a dreamlike manner, I heard a cooing sound, similar to morning doves. I had the feeling that whoever was talking to me was stern, and was telling me that it was for our own good. The woman then describes waking up with a sore spot on her head, and the alien being gone without a trace. She insists it was not a dream, and that she really saw an alien creature that she believes will one day return. For her sake, let us hope it was simply a dream. Number 5 on this list is the WOW signal. The wow signal is a sound that an astronomer received many years ago that, as of right now, is probably the closest thing we've ever gotten to alien contact. Now I do want to say that just because we got this signal doesn't mean that they're living among us. However, it does give a strong indication that they're out there in the first place, which is frankly half the battle. Intelligencer writes, In 1977, Ohio State's Big Ear Radio Telescope intercepted a 72 second burst of sound that bore signs of having come from interstellar space, which could be a sign of extraterrestrial communication. The anomaly measured 1420 megahertz, a frequency in the water hole, the term for a radio emission range thought ideal for intergalactic messages because it's unusually quiet. Jerry A. Amen, the astronomer who spotted it was so excited that he scribbled a giant wow on his printout. Astronomers' explanations for the bizarre phenomenon include secret spy satellites and a passing comet nobody knew about in 1977. But many admit nothing explains it adequately, and even if the signal doesn't prove aliens exist, it's still a tug on the cosmic fishing line. To date, it remains the best evidence of alien communication ever obtained. So, wow! How is right in this case? To receive something like that is a very strong indication that not only is there life out in the universe, but it's also intelligent life. At least intelligent enough to be operating sound systems powerful enough to emit such a frequency in the first place. Again, it's not proof that they're assuredly here on Earth, but it's a good start for sure. Number 4 on this list is Habitable Planets. Scientists are currently finding more and more planets that are in what is called the Goldilocks Zone. The Goldilocks Zone is the area from a star that is not too cold and also not too hot, so it should be able to support life from how we've come to understand it. As science learns more and more about these planets, there have been a few that have surfaced that scientists are particularly bullish about. Proxima b, Trappist-1 system, LHS 114OB, 
Ross 128B, GJ 1214B. Now, those probably mean absolutely nothing to you at all, but those are all the planets that have been discovered to be in the Goldilocks zone and could support life. They are also all the planets that people have reported scientists not wanting to talk about. There's a bit of a conspiracy theory going on right now that scientists have actually discovered proof of alien life in these locations, but are hiding it from the public so as to not start a mass chaos. Now, this is all speculation, but why else would these scientists want to hide information about planets that are apparently in the perfect spot to harbor life? Hard to say for sure, but aliens are definitely a possibility. Number three on this list is the numbers game. The universe has widely been believed to be infinite. That means it's really freaking big. If the universe is infinite, then it only makes sense that there would be at least some place out there that has other life. That, my friends, is basically the numbers game. BBC writes, Most scientists agree that alien life almost certainly exists in the universe somewhere. Our galaxy contains in the region of 300 billion stars, and we're now discovering planets traveling around these stars. The more we look and the more technology we put out there, the more of these exoplanets we find. To date, we've detected around 4,000, and that's just in our galaxy. If we look at the universe as a whole, then there are approximately 200 billion galaxies. Why would life just occur here? We're pretty convinced it's out there, says space scientist Maggie Adder and Pocock. It is purely a numbers game. It is a probability. So this argument makes a lot of sense to me, guys. 200 billion galaxies. That, that is a lot of galaxies and a lot of stars in those galaxies and basically just a lot of chances to have life appear. Now, this life doesn't necessarily need to be living among us. It could be out in the universe waiting to be found, but similar to our wow signal example, this is a great start. It's widely believed in the scientific community that there is life out there and who knows, maybe it's here too. Number two on this list is the billionaires. Now this is going to be a bit of a fallacy because I'm going to appeal to authority with this one. Basically I'm going to say that there are a bunch of smart, powerful, and rich people out there who believe in the existence and presence of aliens and therefore we should too. Now I understand that this is a fallacy and not concrete evidence, but I do believe that acknowledging these people's opinions and at least questioning why they might be thinking this way, well that's important. Let's name off a few people who are currently obsessed with space travel and contacting aliens. Robert Bigelow, Elon Musk, Paul Allen, Yuri Milner, Jeff Bezos, Franklin Antonio. What do these gentlemen have in common? Well, they are all super rich and they are all fascinated with space and aliens. Now this isn't proof of anything. This isn't evidence that says aliens are among us, but I do think that it's a sign. If I saw these men all investing in the same stock, then I would also invest in that same stock. If I saw all of these men looking at the same thing, and in this case, aliens and space travel, and throwing billions of dollars at it, then I'd wonder to myself, why are they doing that? Well, they're probably doing that because they seem to think that aliens are in fact real and potentially are among us. I can comfortably acknowledge that every single one of those people that I listed is more intelligent than I am, and if every one of them are deeply invested in aliens, then I think that's a sign maybe we should be as well. And finally, number one on this list is the encounters. Sometimes we think of encounters with aliens as being few and far between, or that those who have had encounters with said aliens are off their rocker or aren't being truthful. Based on the amount of encounters that we've had and the individuals or groups involved in said encounters, both of those assumptions are categorically false. The fact of the matter is that there have been hundreds, thousands of encounters that humans have had with potential alien life throughout the years. Detailed accounts of everything that went down. Stuff that doesn't seem likely for someone to make up. Whether it be Barney and Betty Hill's abduction, Antonio Villas Boas, the Foo Fighters, the Kecksburg UFO crash, Kenneth Arnold's incident, the Phoenix Lights, or any of the other many notable encounters that have happened in the past, no one can deny that people have been seeing aliens for quite a while. So picking an encounter at random, let's talk about the Travis Walton abduction. 
This is just another one of the many encounters that hit the big news after it happened. Intelligencer says, in 1975, a team of loggers claimed their 22-year-old co-worker, Travis Walton, disappeared for five days after a glowing disc in the Arizona woods zapped him with a bluish ray. Intrigued, he'd reportedly wandered underneath the hovering object and it abducted him. He claims he awoke on a table in a sterile looking room surrounded by three well-developed fetuses wearing tan robes. He tried to flee, passed out, then regained consciousness only once the aliens had ditched him on the Arizona roadside. The news blew up when Walton was finally found. Apparently him and the group of guys passed lie detector tests and Walton himself was taken to a hypnotist to try and see if he was lying, which he wasn't. So in this case it's clear Walton at least wholeheartedly believes he's telling the truth. Also, if he wasn't telling the truth, or that's not what happened to him, then where the heck was he for five entire days? A guy just vanished off of the face of the planet for five days and is found walking along the roadside in Arizona later? Like, that doesn't just happen, folks. Due to the extensive amount of encounters and the detail to which the stories are described, how can we say without a doubt that aliens aren't living among us? I'll answer that for you. We can't. Number five, the Barney and Betty Hill incident. The case of Barney and Betty Hill has puzzled UFO enthusiasts for generations and is considered one of the most well documented, well discussed UFO abduction stories. And also President Obama's favorite, he's making a documentary on it. In 1961, a young couple, Betty and Barney Hill, were driving home through New Hampshire when they saw a bright light flying through the sky. Two hours later, they found themselves back in their driveway without knowing what had happened, confused, shocked, and afraid. The couple claimed that they traveled to a star system 39 light years from Earth, Zeta Reticuli. Before this point, there weren't really many widespread stories of abductions in the United States, so this story caught on wildly. As they were driving home, the couple noticed something bright in the sky. Feeling dizzy and drowsy, the two of them found themselves asleep and waking up in their driveway, completely lost as to how they got there. When they'd awoken, Betty was convinced that they'd experienced a close encounter and went to Air Force to report their sightings. They would spend the next two years explaining their case to various government officials and medical professionals. Mr. Barney Hill would go on to recount to a psychiatrist that he was having nightmarish, repetitive dreams. He would recall these creatures with slanted eyes and gray skins that took them on board and experimented on them by taking samples of their flesh and hair. The two underwent hypnosis therapy from a licensed psychologist in a hopes to uncover what they could have experienced and repressed. And shockingly, Eddie Hill was able to draw a map of the stars seemingly from memory, a planet orbiting Zeta Reticuli. The map was nearly spot on, a near perfect recreation of the stars surrounding the actual solar system. This event would end up leading to the Air Force launching Project Blue Book, the clandestine program to research UFO and abduction stories and investigate just what's out there. And if you're looking for more UFO content, even stuff on Project Blue Book, we've got all of that and then some. Come take a look through at all the declassified files, stories of abduction, sightings, close encounters, and way, way more. So stay subscribed, stay scared. Scared, but more importantly, stay watching this video. I worked hard on it. We got lots more abduction stories coming up for you in just a second. Number four, Terrell Copeland. For some, too many abduction stories come from a disreputable source, you know? Well, our next story comes from a former United States Marine, Terrell Copeland. A man who'd seen the brink and back and had never been shook like this before in his life. Pop those ears open and take a listen. Copeland reported this in 2007. He was living in his Virginia apartment when he saw an orb of white light across the street and hovered in the air, some 300 meters above the ground, and changing colors rapidly. Now, Terrell had the same reaction most people like you and I might have, seeing a glowing, colorful disco ball in the sky, and he thought, well, that's kind of weird, something's wrong. So we recorded it, posted footage online, and claims this is where his life took a dark turn. He was taking a nap in his apartment, and he said it sounded as if someone was breaking in. He called out into the darkness, asking who was invading his space, and he saw the doorknob move and heard scratching at his door. He grabbed a firearm that he kept in his apartment and went to go ready it, but found himself completely frozen, unable to move no matter how bad he wanted to. He claims he heard a voice that spoke to him, internally, as if it was his own thoughts, saying, you don't need to do that. We won't harm you. I'm pretty sure if I heard that from inside my head, I would leap out my window just to be safe and take my chances somersaulting down the road because I'm probably safer there. Now, 
Doctors thought this incident was sleep paralysis, a condition in which one can experience vivid, vivid auditory and visual hallucinations during period of insomnia and even freeze up. But Copeland would complain of hours missing that he couldn't remember. He said there was a span of about four hours over the course of two nights that he couldn't remember a single second of. So Copeland began to keep notes and sketches of his memories as he started to have these blocked memories resurfacing. He claimed that he saw a person with an elongated skull and pitch black eyes and said he had a vivid memory of standing on a balcony waving at a cylinder shaped ship. On a positive note for all of this, Copeland says that he doesn't believe this incident has haunted him, but feels that it's made him a better person and asking more questions, and it's definitely given him a story to tell at parties. Number 3. Frederick Valentich Frederick Valentich was an Australian pilot. He was well trained and he was an avid enthusiast of UFOs and extraterrestrials. Lucky for him, he might have seen one. Sadly for him, it was the last time anyone saw him. It was 1978 and Frederick disappeared over his 125 nautical mile training flight over the Australian mainland. While at 4,500 feet in the air, Valentich reported that there was an unidentifiable craft following behind him. Melbourne Flight Services insisted that there wasn't any other aircraft in the space with him, but Frederick replied back, no, there's something on my tail. He described it as glowing with four repeating bright lights and rushing past him. Valentich said it was shiny, metallic and chrome and he was on radio with air control for five minutes before he started mysteriously experiencing engine trouble. The flight controller asked him again what was following him. Valentich responded, it's hovering and it is not an aircraft. And this was the last thing anyone ever heard from Frederick Valentich. Authorities were completely unable to recover his craft and after an intense search threw their shoulders up at a loss. A local farmer alleged that he had seen a strange flying object in the sky the same day as Valentich's disappearance. The farmer went on to explain that he claims he saw the plane attached to this UFO. He told officials that he was scared to tell anyone about what he had seen for fear he would be the town laughing stock if he was a farmer raving about a UFO. Tragically, in the end, we're no closer to understanding what happened to Frederick now than we were all those years ago in 1978. Did Frederick get his wish? Did he get to see an alien up close? Did they take him back to the stars or who knows? And we may never know. I don't know. Number two, Travis Walton. Alien abduction stories can be a little much sometimes. I'm sure you can agree. Even for those with very open minds, you know, they all seem kind of the same. And usually you can poke holes through them and find all the little weird details that don't add up. I'll take a listen to this one. Travis Walton's story is one of the most famous abduction examples on record. You might be familiar with it before if you study UFO stuff a lot. I've covered it a few times on this channel before because I think it is one of the most fascinating abduction stories. So let's hear it. In 1975, Travis Walton was working as a logger on an otherwise unremarkable day. And he was with six other loggers driving around in the forest when they saw something incredibly bright shining at them through the treetops. One of the men claimed that it looked like a flattened saucer. Walton stepped out of the truck to investigate and was struck by some invisible force that had knocked him backward. This startled the rest of the crew who drove off in a flurry. And it's a great way to find out who your real friends are. Your real friends are not the guys who leave you in the woods where you're about to get abducted. I wouldn't do that to you. When the crew returned, Walton had vanished. Travis awoke and had thought that he'd been taken to a hospital because suddenly he found himself in a blindingly bright, sterile room and could hear people moving around him. But it wasn't until he got a good look at his doctors that he realized something was very wrong. Three feet tall, brown quarter sized pupils and marshmallow like skin. Walton freaked out, I think as most of us probably would do, and was restrained by his captors. He fought them off but was greeted by a tall creature that he said resembled human but was mad masked by an intimidating helmet, kind of a Darth Vader deal. This masked creature took Walton and escorted him back into the operating room, put a translucent mask over his face, while Walton drifted out of consciousness over and over again, unsure if anything that was happening was real. The next thing he remembers is walking alongside a highway as if nothing had ever happened. He eventually found his way to a phone and called for his brother-in-law, who panickedly asked what had happened. It turned out that Walton had been gone for five days. He was untraceable. Search parties had formed looking for him, sent dogs and choppers, tracked him from the woods, but no one could find any sign of him, as if he blinked right out of existence and then blinked right back. Travis swore what happened to him was absolutely real, an abduction, and he's maintained this ever since that fateful week in 1975. Now, if you really think this story is fascinating and you wish you could have seen some footage of what Travis described, unfortunately, he didn't bring his camcorder. You can, however, watch a 
90s movie directly based off the case called Fire in the Sky. It's on Amazon Prime or something, I'm sure. And finally, number one, the Berkshire incident. Now, here's the thing with most UFO sightings they're isolated scenarios, you know? One sleep deprived night watchman sees something weird out the corner of his eye. Somebody up way too late sees something up in the sky. It's hard to believe just one person's story. That's why it's significantly harder to write off the experience of Berkshire County, where half the town reported seeing the same UFO. Uncanny and unprecedented, 250 residents and more all reported seeing the same UFOs flying across the night sky. So it was 1969. Multiple residents across town spotted blinding lights above Sheffield in the southern Berkshires. Witnesses reported that the lights they saw were beaming from saucers, bright lights onto the horizon. Some residents said that they felt that time was slowing down as they watched the object, claiming that it left them frozen and stunned, wondering just what it was they were looking at. One witness comes from a young student, one Thomas Reed, who said that he saw one of the floating entities, a glowing orb, dashing outside the forest. He claims he heard an eruption of crickets and frogs and a loud deafening sound, and then inexplicably, two hours had passed without anyone understanding why or how. His mother and grandmother had switched car seats as well. Now, as an adult, Thomas Reed claims that over time, his family has corroborated what had happened to them. He speaks of being in this immensely large, almost infinitely spanning metal hangar with hallways and hallways stretching out forever. Thomas Reed took a polygraph test telling this story and was found to be 99.1% truthful. Multiple people across Berkshire that day reported similar stories. Balls of light, flying saucers, losses of time, finding themselves somewhere they couldn't explain. The residents of Berkshire may never get to the bottom of what happened there, but I know the truth is out there. And I know Top 5 Scary is going to find it, I'm pretty sure. Number 5. Strange Things in the Skies Now I know I talked about this in a previous video, and if you're a really good Top 5 Scary fan, maybe you'll recognize some of these. But since I aired that last video, way more weird stuff has happened. So it only seems fitting that we'd run through it once again. Starting on February 10th, yours truly's birthday by the way, there was a pattern of incredibly bizarre happenings in the skies, and some very, very dodgy answers from government officials who refused to confirm or deny anything, which always seems more suspicious than less. So here's a quick Coles Notes play-by-play -play of the last few weeks. On February 10th, US fighter jets brought down a still unidentified object over the coast of Alaska. Now, this object has not been confirmed what it is at all or identified, but it's been confirmed as not being a balloon. Okay, that's one thing, only a million left to go. One official referred to it as being the size of a small car, which is definitely beyond strange. You think you would see that flying around? This single event would probably be enough to set tinfoil hats on fire and keep me in business for the next few years making videos about conspiracies, but the literal next day on February 11th, a UFO was shot down over Canada around the Yukon. That's the big territory up on the left, right by Alaska. A US fighter jet downed this one, and it was described as being smaller than the first and cylindrical in nature, which is gonna come up a few times before this video is done, so hold on to that thought, there's still more. February 12th, we had something bizarre shot down over Lake Huron, an object that first appeared over Montana, reappeared on Sunday, before being shot down with an octagonal structure and strings hanging off of it, but it wasn't carrying anything, which is bizarre. And then over Billings, Montana, there was something very bizarre that was seen falling from the sky, leaving a thick orange chemtrail, and residents were left in the dark about it. Local residents wondered just what it was, and some Redditors in a group noticed around the area that there had been an increased military presence since the sighting. So just what is going on around here? there and just about everywhere. But if you can't wait at all and you just want to watch alien videos all day, I agree with you. That's what I do every single day and it's a great way to live. We've got loads of alien and UFO vids, NASA conspiracies, all the things they don't want you to know. And if that ain't your jam, we got scary stories, horror movies, monsters, cryptids, true crime, just about everything spooky under the sun and above it. So stay subscribed to Top 5 Scary, but most importantly, stay scared. And keep watching this video because I got way more weird stuff coming up for you. Number four, the Tom DeLonge sighting. If you're a UFO enthusiast, then you know that one of the leading names in UFO research and discovery right now is Tom DeLonge, the nasally voiced frontman for pop punk project Blink 182. And if you didn't know that, now you do. Although I suspect most of the people who watch our videos don't know that band. Anyway, little trivia for you. That's what he does when he's not selling out $300 concerts. He hunts aliens and he's pretty good at it. If some of the footage he gathers is anything to go by, why don't you take a look at this weird footage he shared on his Instagram a couple days ago. It's gonna go right there.
pretty darn weird, huh? If that isn't one of the most clear, close encounters I've ever seen, I'm not sure what is. You can practically like trace the outline of the flying saucer. It looks like the platonic flying saucer, like the, the one we all imagine when we close our eyes. I can almost see the little green man inside. On his Instagram, DeLong wrote this caption, enjoy. They are real. To the Stars Media will be turning real events like these into major feature films and television series to bring the facts to the world. Note the whirling sound from the propulsion. Now, To the Stars is the fringe research company owned by Tom DeLonge, hoping to spread information and explore the possibility of UFOs and UAPs and it does also sound like it's a plan to get Tom DeLonge some more money by making a cinematic alien universe. Whatever his end game is though, can't deny the footage posted here is eerily compelling. Number three, Gary McKinnon. Now I've talked a bit about Gary McKinnon before on this channel because I am obsessed with this story. He's a notorious hacker who broke into NASA's security. His story is a cool one. I love anytime you hear someone pulling a fast one over a government agency like this, so it bears repeating. He's a genius computer hacker with a lot of spare time and wanted to know just what the Yanks were hiding from his home in Scotland. He wanted to go after NASA's data server to see if they had anything hidden they'd never told anybody about. Been called the biggest military hack of all time, so I'd wager maybe he found something. Why risk your life, career, freedom on this exactly? McKinnon claims he had received an insider tip that the US had reverse engineered technology from UFOs, free energy. In his own words, he said, this should not be kept hidden from the public when pensioners can't even pay their fuel bills. And it's just like a bonus if you get some alien stuff on the side. So what did he find? McKinnon claims in his searching, he saw images of aircraft that did not resemble any he had ever seen in his life. One in particular, he describes as looking like a massive cigar shaped craft floating over the northern hemisphere that did not look man made. He said he was in shock looking at the image and didn't think to take a photo. Well, there's those cylindrical shaped crafts again. I told you to th keep thinking about them and keep thinking about them again because they're gonna show up one more time before this video is done. Well, that wasn't the only exciting thing he found. He also found something called the Disclosure Project, a 400 page document outlining testimonials from government agents across multiple branches of service recording sightings of unidentified objects, but that wasn't even the meal ticket. The real jewel was a document of a non-terrestrial officer's sheet. A spreadsheet listing the name of NASA agents to be transferred to new ships or serve on board space stations, but McKinnon noted that none of the names of the vessels existed in any database. Huh. Now, I don't know how much you know about the US government, but they absolutely love it when you poke holes in their important security, triply so if you do it from the comfort of your bedroom in a country away. The US tried their level best to extradite McKinnon, but we're prevented by the crown from serving out a 70 year sentence. McKinnon is doing well. He recently took to the UFO subreddit to answer questions from fans and true believers. There wasn't a whole lot of new information, but it's just nice to know he hasn't been shoved into a black van somewhere. Number two, the Navy and their pilots, Navy pilots. In September 2019, Navy spokesperson Joe Gratisher spoke out on three recently released videos by the Army that contained evidence of unexplained aerial phenomena. The Navy agreed that just this once, they would be willing to talk about something weird they'd seen and recorded because pilots are reportedly encountering bizarre things every day and feel just too uncomfortable to report it. One pilot in particular, Ryan Graves, who's a 10 year vet, has said he believes he's seen thousands of unexplained phenomena in the air in his career. But these go unreported because of the stigma attached to the previous theories about what uh, may or may not be in the videos in his words. To translate that a bit in layman's terms, the Navy feels that they have to comment so that pilots are willing to talk about that hey, maybe we're seeing UFOs without feeling too crazy. These videos in question were released from 2017 to 2018 and they feature long oblong shaped objects captured with infrared that disappear in the Earth's atmosphere. Hey, there it is again, more cylindrical shaped UFOs. Now I'll be clear, I don't really have much of a connection or through line here, but I do think it's very fascinating how many of these stories do mention these cylindrical shaped objects. Far from the earliest or last, in 2004 and in 2015, two similar sightings were reported featuring similar 
similar vehicles. Now, the purpose of investigating most of these reports is more focused on safety hazards and threats of national security. And at the same time, maybe they're not openly admitting they've got UFOs flying around, but they're getting pretty darn close. The 2004 sighting, I think, is a particularly fascinating one. Two pilots, one Commander Fravor and one Lieutenant Commander Slate, called it in, reporting that they saw objects out of nowhere at some 80,000 feet in the air and then descending rapidly towards the Pacific Ocean, stopping at around 20,000 feet and hovering in place. They would drop out of radar range or shoot directly up in the sky on a 90 degree angle. You know, normal things aircrafts love to do. They weren't American crafts and they weren't recognized by any organizations they'd ever seen. Maybe it's tech not of this world. Number one, government councils. You know, the era we're in right now is probably one of the most fascinating times to be invested in UFOs and unexplained alien sightings. So consider yourself lucky because it seems like we are getting dangerously close to a government finally confessing it. It feels like we're weeks away some days, you know? The UAP report was a seminal turning point when the Pentagon outright admitted they had thousands of documents and reports and investigations into the possibility of life somewhere out there in the Milky Way. Over the years, there have been a few investigations into unexplained aerial phenomena, but they're usually pretty hush-hush clandestine. Project Blue Book is probably the most famous secret project among them, but that was, you know, a secret. Well, in the interest of trans transparency, as of October 2022, NASA is coming clean, washing their hands, and opening a new study into the research of extraterrestrial life. 16 hand-picked scientists and specialists have been selected to analyze data and determine how best to go forward when observing events. And they're not really looking at past cases, they're more looking towards future things. And this project will include researchers, Personnel from all divisions, including former astronaut Scott Kelly, who served as the pilot for the Discovery Shuttle and also held the world record for most days in space. So I guess he probably knows one or two things about space, maybe, and I'm sure he's seen something weird. Kelly himself doesn't personally believe in aliens, saying, I think there's probably intelligent life in the universe, but I don't think they visit planet Earth. Why not? We got lots of great stuff out here. We got water slides, we got Vin Diesel, no other planet has those two things, and I'm, I'm sure we got a couple other great things from the human experience. So aliens, come on down when you're ready. We'll welcome you with open arms, and if those were UFOs you sent, we're really sorry that we shot those down. I didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> <laughs>